Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Marlene says at home, I don't talk loud enough. So she may want me to carry this home. I don't know. <laughs> Before we start, Randall, would you lead our minds in prayer? Amen. Thank you, Randall. Yeah, Marlene says, I go in the two rooms away and whisper. <laughs> These women are laughing. They've told people that too. <laughs> well, uh, Bill Ridley called me Friday. He said, oh, uh, we want you to teach the class Sunday morning too. I said, well, okay, we'll be in the city on Saturday. <laughs> Maybe I'll have Marlene fix up a lesson or something. <laughs> no, we're going to look at the book of Jude. You know, when you read a book, the most exciting part of a book to me is the last part of the book. You know, that's when things start coming together and it seems to pick up a lot of steam. I'm a big Dickens fan. Dickens is my favorite author, okay? But you notice in all the Dickens books, the last few chapters go like a motorcycle. The rest of it kind of is like people walking through the countryside. So it's, it's exciting that way. Well, the last part of the Bible, you know, Peter, John, Jude, Revelation, to me, that just, it's just builds up steam toward the end. I, I just love it. The last part is so exciting to me whenever I read those books. So let's look at Jude. I call it Hey Jude. Marlene asked me what I was lessons going to be on. I told her, she said, well, okay, just don't try to sing it. Jude talks about the way of Cain. You ever think about the way of Cain? What happened to Cain? What his life was, was like? Uh, I mean, it, it would make an interesting book all by itself. The book of Jude but is a warning to us about false teachers. And these are teachers who secretly creep into the fellowship. So let's just look briefly at the book of Jude uh, for the class here. Look at verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. That's one of my favorite verses. Once for all, it was delivered to the saints. But he saw, first he mentions a common salvation. What does that mean to you? Now, this is a class. Everybody can speak up. What does a common salvation mean when you read that? What does that hit you? We're all saved alike. We're all saved. We share in salvation, okay? We're all saved alike. Yeah, it's available to all. You know, it's not available to some people and, and closed to other people. Uh, we need to remember that. God wants all men to be saved. It doesn't matter what color they are, what country they're from, what culture they've grown up in. God still wants everybody to be saved. And that's a big lesson to, for us to learn because we all grow up in our own cultures. We have our own built-in uh, opinions about everybody else. But it's available to all. It's denied to none. God is not denying salvation to anybody. All, but they have to comply. Comply with the conditions that are relative to it. And that's the key. You can't be saved by just existing. God wants you to be saved. It's there. It's available to everybody. But you must, com you must contend for the faith and comply with the conditions. 
but it refers in this time period to Jews, to Gentiles, to slave, to free, to male, to female. Depends on the culture there, right? But to look at the last part, once and for all delivered. Now what does that mean when you get to it? What do you think? When it says it's once and for all delivered. Contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Once for all. Well, now wait a minute. I read in my history book about John Smith. He said, now, uh, he's had another revelation from an angel and he wrote it down in a book and he caused a whole group of people to move toward Utah. Oh, what you're saying is John Smith was a liar. Oh, you are. Whoa, okay. Well, what about uh, this book? There have been a couple other books that they have, quote, found uh, since we've gotten our Bible. And I don't remember the names of them, but they were named after Bible age people. Anybody remember some of those books that they've said they found? Dorlinda shouldn't know them. She knows everything. Uh, Yes, the lost books, that may be one. Uh, the, yes, I've seen that somewhere. Yeah, that, but they were brought out individually. Well, shouldn't we accept those? There's some honest people that brought those out, didn't they? Oh. <laughs> well, how can we not... Yeah, these are pretty smart people, though. I mean, these smart people said, hey, I got a book of Randall. I just found this book of Randall, and it was he's an old prophet, and it wasn't included in the original Bible. But look at all these interesting things, really smart things, he says. And I've got a Ph.D. and several things, and I'm saying this book of Randall is something we should add to our Bible. Spoken like a true elder. <laughs> because of exactly what I started with. I have a PhD. And the more I publish, the more notoriety I get and fame I get for my PhD. I'm likely to get tenure. <laughs> um, yeah. Book of Thomas, that's the one I was thinking of, yeah. But uh, they don't add anything to these words. It just confirms more than anything else. You have to be careful, though, because if we start accepting that as true gospel, there's something in it that may not be true, you know. We have to be careful. We have to go back here and we say, look, this was once for all delivered to the saints. What does that mean, once for all? That means it, Right. We don't have anything else to add to it. We don't have to have another gospel. This was once and for all. What we need for our faith is right here. It's been delivered to us. This is it. Well, why don't we take advantage of it more? What is there about us that takes this Bible that contains everything we need for an eternity once and for all delivered to us, preserved miraculously preserved throughout all our history, intact, why don't we take advantage of it? Read it every day, study it, learn from it, be awed by it. What's wrong with us that we don't take advantage of it? I mean, this is a jewel, once and for all delivered. This, we're not looking for another gospel to add to it. We're not looking for a new revelation to come along. The Bible says God created man. Why do we need Darwin to come up, philosophize, oh, we all evolved from a single cell organism which miraculously got up on land and somehow 
part. All you have to do is realize from a biochemical nature uh, uh, status, the biochemistry of the reactions in our body could not have come about by any process except by creation. You could not have made the Krebs cycle, which has to operate inside us to make energy by evolution. Why? Because it involves enzymes at every step. And the Darwin says, you've got to have a reason for something to be existent. Well, there's no reason for a certain enzyme to exist in the first place because the product it leads to was not uh, necessary at the time. You can't go from step A to step D and just miraculously have step B and C there. They're not there. You can't have a Krebs cycle. Look at the majesty of light. Take a look at eye, the eye. How was the eye formed by God to accept light, to interpret light into images? How have you ever, have you ever thought about that? There's a biochemistry involved at a cell level. The eye could not have come about by evolution. It's impossible. There's too many intervening steps and things that weren't originally necessary for that to evolve. There is no natural evolutionary process that account, can account for the creation of the eye. I mean, this goes about through almost everything we have about ourselves and our body and how it functions. But if you want to take evolution apart, do it from a biochemical, an atomical nature, not just by supposition, oh, well, this looks like that, so therefore this led to that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, there's something about our human nature that we have to address as we grow up. Part of the maturation process is what you don't have when you're a young child or an early teenager. You don't have the process of putting our human nature on a practical or sensible level of being. Our human nature, yeah... We have to control our human nature about a lot of things. So a lot of it's that way. A lot of people just don't let themselves mature beyond a certain point, so they're always craving something that they can't have. But anyway, good point. Yeah. Why is there still a salamander? Why do we need a salamander? Once it's created something that led to something else, why is it still around? Yeah. So, anyway... There's a, there was a mathematician that came out of Waco who said that the uh, math he worked out, so the mathematical odds of man coming into a being or creation happening from a big bang or anything else, the mathematical odds of things being as perfect as they are are so overwhelmingly high that, math, that ma the, you know, mathematically it's impossible. In other words, it's reached the stage he calculated that was impossible to happen. So he presented this, and what did they do to him? They fired him. <laughs> yeah, Baylor Institution fired him. We can't have you talking against science. He's just he's not talking. He's just presenting a mathematical proof about something, but they don't want to accept it. They don't want to accept it. Anyway, Jude says and teaches us that 
The faith was once and for all delivered. It is a permanent deposit. It is not to be superseded. It's not to be modified. It's not to be um, uh, amended. It was delivered through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 1 11, 2 Peter 1 21. If you want to make notes of those in your Bible as to what that refers to. Galatians 1 11, 2 Peter 1 21. The Bible was delivered through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's not to be modified, amended, added to, superseded. It's permanent, it's here, it's ours. All we have to do is take advantage of it. Well, look at verse 4. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, that's a magnificent verse. That, that sounds like Dickens right there. Sounds like Dickens. False teachers have appeared among the saints. You know, look how long the gospel had been delivered at the time this was written. Less than 100 years, right? And already false teachers were creeping in among the saints. Creeping in, ste stealing in in the depths of the night because they can't be seen until they're there, you know. <laughs> uh, Peter had warned they would bring in destructive heresies back in 2 Peter. This is one of the reasons that I find the last book so exciting. 2 Peter talks about uh, false teachers here. Uh, he said they would bring in destructive heresies. Destructive heresies. Turn back a couple to 2 Peter 2. Those are good. 2 Peter 2, just a few pages back. And look at verses 1 and 2. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there also will be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned. How prevalent is that today? How prevalent is that today, do you think? Darlene says constant. I mean, Sometimes we have to find the right translation for us, right? Because there's been so many different translations, per se. So, but, it, but the news gets out. I mean, we've got brothers in the church have gotten together and made an up-to-date modern translation of the Bible. It came out, what, five or, ten, five or six, seven years ago? I forget the name of it, but um, they offered it one, uh, one year at the... Um, Branson Church of Christ weekend meeting. I don't know if y'all were there. Yeah, they were offering, they mentioned it then. About 60 members of the church were on the board that, was, that created that uh, translation. You know, up to date kind of language and stuff. But it was very close to you know, the original text, so that was good. Uh, I know, I remember when King James was re, not retranslated, but updated. And uh, they went to the American Standard. And for many years, this is American Standard. It was the best translation available to us as a modern people. 
And then a few years ago, they had the new King James translation. And that was even better than the American Standard. As far as I know, that's still there as the top two translations that we can refer to with confidence. But you don't know until you go to a college library how many new versions of the faith there are. It's incredible when you get in there and start reading about who, who wrote this and that about creation, about God or no God or multiple gods and stuff. And people have been coming up with this since the first century. And why do people want to be false teachers? Oh, there are lots of reasons. You know, person, man, money, fame, notoriety, etc. But they've crept in even among the church for all these centuries. So it's true. Yes. It takes study. You bet. It takes study, doesn't it, sometimes? But that's what we're meant to be. But we're warned about it. So beware of the false teachers. And we have to be aware of it. Identify them. Look at verse 7. This is a metaphor. I love metaphors. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Now this metaphor is used and shows how truly bad such men are. Look what these men are compared with. The members of Sodom and Gomorrah. The wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, Sodom is where our word sodomy comes from. You know, sin was so rampant in these cities that God saw fit to destroy them. These men would provoke God to deal with them in a similar fashion as He dealt with Sodom and Gomorrah. So the false teachers were so bad or could be so evil or dealing with such wicked things that they're compared with the men in Sodom and Gomorrah. How would you like to be guilty of sin to the extent where God says, you're just like the, the citizens of Sodom? How would you like that for an accusation? Well, that's a false teacher. That's what his metaphor is here. If you want to teach a gospel other than what's in our gospel, and claim, and claim that that's the real truth, God says, you're as bad as a citizen of Sodom, and I'm going to deal with you just as harshly. Ooh, that's a scary proposition, isn't it? That's why metaphors are powerful in literature. Uh, Jesus used metaphors a lot in His teaching, because people can relate to those kind of things. In verse 8, we read, In the same manner these men... Also by dreaming, defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. Now there's a sermon for Ron. Oh, the false teachers are living in a dream world. He says, also by dreaming. They, what's, a, what's a word for a guy living in a, a uh, dream world? What? Delusional. That's the word I'm looking for. She is so smart. Sometimes you've got to stay around and talk to her. Ask her biblical questions. She knows the answers. You know, we need to know each other a little bit more, I think. Find out a little bit more about each other. That's part of the fellowship. Well, anyway. Uh, dream world. They're living in a dreamy world. They delude themselves. They're deluding themselves. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of professors out there who are deluding themselves. When I was in college, I had five minors. And one of my minor was, minors was in biology. And part of the biology, one was a three-hour course I took in human evolution. The professor, even though this was University of Colorado, the professor for that course was a visiting professor 
from uh, Southern California. Oh, he came in. Let me tell you, you had no recourse to object. He presented a certain line on evolution, and that was it. There was no argument. There was no secondary thought. It was this way. And when he gave us a final, he gave us an essay. And he said, your final grade will be based on this essay. And when we handed in the essay, he took them and went back to California. He sent us our grades. He sent us our grades. He wasn't going to stay around and debate the essays. He wasn't going to stay around. He said, this this way, period. This man was delusional. <laughs> There's no way to describe delusional. They're set on one particular way, and they're not open to any other suggestions, alternatives, anything. You know, this way may be wrong, but they're going to stick to it no matter what. They were delusional. These false teachers are often delusional. And because of their delusion, look what happens. Jude says, one, they defile the flesh. 2 Peter 2.10. 2 Peter 2.10. And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority, daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Boy, they indulge in fleshly desires. And that's where we came up with the 60s philosophy. What feels good is good. What feels good is good. Hey, it was tough for us to grow up in the 60s. People say, well, I grew up in the 80s or I grew up in the 90s and it's tough. Well, we had a hard time. You don't even know what it was growing up in this country in the 60s. First of all, we had to face Vietnam. Then we had to face all the cultural, quote, revolution that was going on here at home. And it dealt with this philosophy. If it feels good, it's fine. It's okay. Let's indulge our fleshly desires. Let's get on those drugs. Let's create all sorts of sexual diseases. Man's sensuality can be the judge of what's right and wrong. Ah, what's right and wrong? I'm not going to use the Bible. I'm going to use what feels good. That tells me what's right or wrong. If it feels good, it's got to be right. If it feels good, it's okay. That's my sensuality being the judge of what's right and wrong. Not the Bible. We have to be careful of that. We, have to be, we can fall into this without even knowing it. Because, hey, this feels good, this feels fine. The 60s mentality gone amok. The 60s mentality gone crazy. This is what defiling the flesh means. The second thing is these people reject authority. Uh, Peter, he says, they d despire authority or reject authority. What does that mean, they reject authority? What's he talking about? No respect for authority. What's the authority? The word, our law, that's what he's talking about here is God's law. But right, it also, when you reject authority, you despise or reject the law of the land too, right? The Bible talks about that. You know, obeying the king and his civil authority, etc. I talked to uh, a friend who bragged one time he used to, he, he, could, he liked on the freeways because he can go 80 miles an hour on the freeways. I said, well, what's the speed limit? Well, it's 75. I said, well, if the Bible says don't reject, don't despise authority, obey the law, the king's civil laws, what are you doing when you're going 80? He looked at me and he says, I'm sinning. So later on, I asked him, what do you drive on the freeway now? He says, 70. I says, why? 
He said, because that's the law. He says, uh, he, does, he changed. He no longer rejected that authority. But there are a lot of people who reject authority. Hey, I don't that. Let's just pick, nobody's look at me. I'll just pick that up and walk off with it. It's just a little thing. Walmart's got a lot of them. And I can't really afford it right now. So I'll just put my pocket and they won't catch me here. Uh, and people, of course, do that for a living. Rejecting, despising authority. But here they're talking about disavowing God's authority in favor of man's own authority. So despising what God says and putting forth what man says. And we know that that's true about a lot of different things today. That um, we want to set man's authority up to do this, that, and the other. So we don't want to know what God does. Okay? One thing that worries me a lot is, as I've gotten older, more especially, is how we take the pattern of God's worship and change it because it makes us feel better and we think it makes us elevate our worship, etc. So let's just have a, a, a choir and where nobody has to sing but just listen to it, but you can sing in your heart. Uh, or let's just have uh, guitars. I, you know, as there's a wonderful preacher in Branson uh, named Jerry uh, North. He preaches at the west, uh, the, uh, the the little congregation. Is it what's it? The uh, 65 North 65, or no, not 65, 75 congregation there. It's behind uh, Clay Cooper Theater. It's a little congregation. It sits about, it looks like a house, but it's right in the middle of the strip, down just over the top of the hill, right behind Clay Cooper. And he runs an, a wonderful missionary. He feeds people who are living on the streets. He goes out into the gutter and he recruits them to listen to the Word of God, be baptized, come to service, but he feeds them, gives them groceries, etc. And he's done this for years and years. He's 80 years old now. It's still going strong. Uh, but he talks about guitar, where I got on this was his, he said, I can't find in the Bible where it says God wants guitars in his worship service. <laughs> and and you know, it's a way of saying. It makes our music better, so let's just put them there. Man put them there. You know, the organ was not added, or instrumental music was not added to the worship service, to the Catholic Church added it in 400 in, in, in something, 450 or something. And until then, they worshiped a cappella. That's the pattern, it says in the New Testament. We know that. That's the pattern of worship. So man changed that pattern. And my question is, if it's different from the pattern that's in the Bible, in the New Testament, what's the authority for it? Whose authority put that there? It's man's authority, right? Man's authority to put that there. So it worries me that we will be held accountable for that one day. And, and I... It does, and so it makes me more assured to follow the pattern. There's a great book out there from the 50s called Follow the Pattern, or Behold the Pattern. You'd have to look it up now. I know it's out of print, but it's the whole idea is there's a pattern of worship God gave us, and we ought to stick to it as much as we can, uh, as far as we're able. So disavowing God's authority in, far, in favor of man's. So any time that something happens in worship service or in our lifestyle, one thing in the back of my mind we ought to ask ourselves is, what is the authority for this? I'm behaving this way. What authority do I have to do this? I'm worshiping this way. What authority do I have for doing this? Is this God's authority or is it mine authority? Okay. Now I brush my teeth. And I do the two-minute thing most of the time with the electric toothbrush. 
What authority do I have that? I've got the dental association authority that tells me that that's a good way to keep my teeth clean. So that's the, I'm doing that on the basis of the ADA authority. Does that affect my salvation? No. <laughs> that's the freedom I have as, as God's given me as a human being is I can do something on the authority of man because it doesn't affect my salvation. But if it affects my salvation, I need to know what authority makes me do it. So we need to remember, we need to humble ourselves before the authority of God. And false teachers reject that authority. The third thing it mentions here is they revile angelic majesties. Peter calls them glories. That means they have no respect for God's holiness or God's power. That's what that means. There are many ways to show disrespect to God. There are a lot of ways that we show a disrespect to the God that made us. And what they're doing here is showing a disrespect to the power of God. And we need to remember in our day of life what we're doing as far as respecting God. Is what we're doing showing a respect for God or is it disrespecting God? Are we doing something and it shows a respect for God and what He wants us to? Or is it showing a disrespect for what God wants? My mom said, I don't want to ever be in a place that I'd be ashamed of being if, when Jesus comes. If Jesus comes and finds me there, I don't want to be in a place that's bad. That's showing a disrespect for God. My mom was a great teacher in certain ways. Okay, but yeah, it's interesting. Okay, I'll go down. Let's go down to the saloon. And I love Chris Christopherson because he was a folk singer that spoke to my generation. And he's very poetic. That is a great song so called Silver Tongue Devil. Have you ever heard that song? Wonderful song. It's about a man, he says, Well, I went down to the Tally Ho Tavern to buy me a bottle of beer. I sat down next to a fair young maiden whose eyes were as dark as her hair. And as I went searching from bottle to bottle for something unfoolish to say, that silver-tongued devil just slipped from the shadows and laughing stole her away. Say, hey, little girl, don't you know he's a devil? Uh, he's everything that I ain't. Hiding intentions of evil under the smile of a saint. All he's good for is looking for trouble, shifting his shadow to blame. Some people say he's my double. Some even swear we're the same. But that silver-tongued devil's got nothing to lose. He'll only live till I die. We make our own something and pay our own dues, that silver-tongued devil and I. Inside us, we have a silver-tongued devil wishing to get out, create trouble. And one of the reasons that mine, he finds it easy is that he's, we're down in the saloon going from bottle to bottle. Does God want us there? Are we there to glorify God? Are we respecting God's authority and power? We need to watch how we do. Make sure we're not reviling angelic majesties. Verse 10, But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals. By these things they are destroyed. When men get like this, they are behaving on the level of animals and will bring forth their own destruction. And then verse 11, that's where we started. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. And for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the ways that are a rebellion against God's established authority. God's established authority. So what do we do? We read about this, and this is the value of Jude. Hey Jude, tell me about me. Tell me about how I get to be saved. And he tells us about a way of life 
that we need to pay attention to. So what do I do? How do we protect ourselves from that silver-tongued devil? Verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Two things we can do to protect ourselves from the silver-tongued devil coming out and condemning us. One is build on our faith. How do we build on our faith? God's way. How do we do that? How do we know what that is? The word's there. Come back to it, don't we? All come back to the same thing. The established authority of God. And we're taught in this established authority that there is a power in the word. There is an inherent power in this written word. We can feel it. We can see it operate. We can realize it's real. Okay? If we just take advantage of it, open the book and get into it. The second thing, praying in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean, Randall? Well, where does he live? Where, where can I go to meet the Holy Spirit and recruit him to help me? What? When we're saved, what are we given? We're given the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, we're given a gift. That gift is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, lives in us. Paul tells us the Holy Spirit lives in you. You have the Holy Spirit. So when we pray earnestly, we're praying in the Holy Spirit. If we allow the Holy Spirit to direct our thoughts and mind, minds the way that we want it to. We build on our faith. We pray in the Holy Spirit. When we do those two things, we will protect ourselves from becoming some of these people that Jude talks about. But the important thing beyond that is recognizing these people because they're all around us. We need to tell our kids about them. We need to tell ourselves about them. We need to guard our steps to avoid walking in the paths that they direct. So, Jude, great book, great book. One of the great books of the Bible, even though it's short, toward the end, toward the back. Sometimes we just read it so fast we get right through it and get to Revelation, you know. But Jude is great as far as giving us direction about our lives. So how do we protect ourselves from Satan and his influence through these people and the false teachers? Build on our faith. The stronger our faith becomes, the better we are at handling the environment that we find ourselves in today. And we pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray, you know, every day. Bow your knees before God. Humble yourselves before His throne. Pray letting the Holy Spirit be there, guide you. God knows what we need, what we want to say, even when we don't find the words for it. He reads our hearts. And He does that because the Holy Spirit tells Him. Jesus interprets. Jesus is our lawyer. He presents our case before God. So you got the whole threesome of the Godhead working at us and helping. And as we build our faith and pray, that's what we're calling on to help us. Okay, comments, questions? Uh, Sir? Question. In your opinion, does everybody have a conscience? 
Yes, the Bible says we do. Sometimes it's dulled. We deliberately dull our conscience because we don't want to listen to it. Uh, and that happens all the time. It happens in us sometimes when we get into a certain lifestyle, right? We see it. Uh, but people are born with a conscience. Well, they say, well, how about the uh, antisocial person? You know, the person who has no conscience, no obvious conscience. So he kills because he doesn't, he kills people because they don't mean anything to him. He's dulled that conscience. But that spark he was born with, God wants him to be saved too. Um, you could say that um, Dahmer was a antisocial, no conscience. But somebody went to him and appealed to what used to be his conscience and baptized him in the, hosp in the prison before he was killed. So yeah, they have a conscience. Psychiatrists say you don't. Psychiatrists say this, these people were born without a conscience. I want to work at it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, the Ukrainians are contending earnestly for their homeland. Who would have thought that the little country of the Ukraine, with no big army, no arms, could have contended like they are? Who would have thought that Russians, peasants, could have resisted Hitler in World War II as he drove toward Moscow. Who would have thought that? Who would have thought? Nobody thought that in the whole world, but they contended earnestly. Who would have thought the Filipinos in World War II could have fought as hard as they fought, contended earnestly for a rebirth of freedom in their land like they did? But they did. Who would have thought that? Who would have thought the Huguenots in France could have kept the Bible when everybody else was killing anybody who had the Bible. That was the Dark Ages in France, right? The Inquisition in France, when the Catholic Church declared the Bible was not to be out there for anybody. And they... It hadn't been that long when they had to smuggle Bibles into the Ukraine. You know, I know that uh, Bear Valley had a, a work for a long time of, of taking Bibles into Ukraine. But it was interesting is the way they got across the border was they bribed the guards with Bibles. The guards wanted copies of the Bible. So they let the preachers in, in Ukraine, okay, because they were given copies of the Bible that they were taking in. Interesting, isn't it? The power of the Word beats man every time. <laughs> But yeah, people, I think everybody is born with a conscience. Okay.
Good morning. Welcome to Eastside. We want to extend a warm welcome to everyone this morning, especially our visitors, and invite you to be back with us at any opportunity you have. Along that line, there's a card on the pew in front of you. If you'd fill that out, pass it to the inside aisle, they'll be picked up. Happy birthdays this week to Terry Painter, Joe Brewer, Mike Frost, Brenda Parks. Wonder how old Brenda is. Are you 85 or 86 now? <laughs> that wasn't right. Ernest Brandstetter and Ron the Covington. The baby shower for Justin and Tracy will be today from two to four in the fellowship room. Our deepest sympathies ex extended to Phyllis Dismuke and her family in the death of her daughter, Cindy Dismuke. There will be no public service. There will be a private burial Saturday, August 6th. Former Eastside member Mary Fern Stewart called and her niece, Diana Talley of Duncan, passed away. <clears throat> the elders would like to express their appreciation to Bill Rowan and John Young for their teaching and preaching in Ron's, in Ron's absence. On our prayer list, Benny Waters is in Duncan Regional Hospital, and we have no further details at this time. And please refer to the encourager handout for those in need of our continued prayers. Helping us in our service this morning, Randall Pennypacker will have a second prayer. Carter Wade will lead the singing. John Young will bring our lesson at the appropriate time. Uh, and Terry Painter will have the closing prayer. If you would, let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we're thankful for this privilege, this opportunity we have to come together to worship you, the one true and living God. We are so thankful for that privilege, that opportunity. Father, we're mindful of those that we just mentioned, those that have recently lost loved ones, and though, uh, Brother Benny, as he's in the hospital. We have so many in this congregation, Father, that, are, that fight up. Uh, battle on a daily basis. We pray that you'd be with all of our shut-ins in the nursing homes and be with all those that are caring for those people in the nursing homes and assisted livings. Father, again, we're thankful for this privilege, this opportunity. Pray that you go with us through this day and on through our life. Forgive us, Father, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, again, I'd like to say good morning to everyone. I hope you, everybody's here is ready to sing praises to our Lord. If you'll turn to number 66, you're using our book today. Be our first song of praise to our Lord. Number 66. <laughs> praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here. Number two, another great song of praise, number two in our book. <clears throat> number two, we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. sing every verse, but I've got several songs I want to get in here today before 
John brings us our lesson today. I had uh, John I had so many songs that go along with your lesson. It's unreal. So anyway, looking forward to it. Let's turn to number 543. 543. <clears throat> 543. All right, here we go. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the blessed one gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner, list to the loving call, wonderful words of life. Also freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, the Holy Savior, sanctified forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words. Of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. All right, at this time, uh, Randall, I'd like to ask you to lead us in a word of prayer. And then, following that prayer, we're going to sing number 500, I believe, 538. 538. Carter for those wonderful songs. If you bow with me, we'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we approach thy throne at this time, thanking thee that you have allowed us to gather here and sing these wonderful songs, praising thee. Amen. And Father, we're so thankful for blessing us with Jesus. Through all our blessings flow. And Father, we thank Thank you for your love for mankind and for Jesus that shed his blood on our behalf that we could be reconciled to thee through obedience of our hearts. And Father, we do thank you for the time we spent in the wonderful words here this morning in the Bible class. We thank you for the words of thy servant Jude. We thank you for John for being able to present a lesson this morning on this that was uplifting and beneficial to us all. And Father, we gather around thy table in remembrance of the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf in a few moments. We just pray that our mind and attention is on thee and thy love and the blood he shed for his death on the cross, the, the opportunity we have to be with thee someday in heaven. We do thank thee, Father, for thy love. We just pray that you continue to help us to grow in love for thee. And Father, we just pray for peace. Peace here on earth among mankind. Peace with our neighbors. And Father, some praise for thee. And so someday we may gather with our brothers and sisters and the faithful around thy throne in heaven. To honor the ruler of all universe. We, Father, we do know that you are in control and our worries are in vain. But we know that things work out for good for those that love the Lord. 
Guide us in our lives that we be pleasing unto thee and forgive us the wrongs when we stumble. For we are our fault often, Father, and for this we ask thy forgiveness. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Five hundred thirty-eight. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is seeking sand. All other ground is seeking sand. When darkness fills his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every eye and storm again, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Uh, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, fall as to stand before the throne. Oh, Christ is solid, rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Let's turn to 342. 342. Here in just a moment, Brian is going to be helping us with the great blessing we have of partaking of our Lord's Supper. Let's sing 342 to help prepare our minds for the great event. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet beheld thy cottage home, and that despised the Nazareth. But we believe thy footsteps trod in streets and plains, thou Son of God, but we believe thy footsteps trod in streets and plains, thou Son of God. We saw thee not when lifted high amid that wild and savage crew, nor heard we that imploring cry. Forgive, they know not what they do. But we believe the deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun. But we believe the deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun. We walk not with the chosen few who saw thee from the earth of sin, who raised to heaven their wandering view, then low to earth a prostate bed. But we believe that human eyes beheld that journey to the skies, but we Does everyone have a packet? If you do not, please raise your hand and one will be brought out to you. Thank you, Carrie. I want to look at a few scriptures this morning in our preparation of partaking of 
the Lord's Supper. It's a part of our worship and a privilege that we have to remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made and the opportunity that God gave us to be able to be brought back to him because our sin has separated us from him. God had a plan from the beginning that man might be saved. In Titus 1-2, it says, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. So God, obviously, knowing mankind, knowing that there would be sin, provided a way that we might be saved. God had a great love for mankind, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus gave that life willingly. He wasn't forced to give it. John 10, 18, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. So just like God asked us to give our lives to him willingly, Jesus gave his life for us. And then Christ died for the ungodly, Romans 5, 6 through 8. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The life that Christ lived was in submission to his Father, Philippians 2, 7 and 8. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, even unto death, even death on the cross. And the life that he gave was perfect and holy. Hebrews 4, 15 For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So this is the privilege that we have of remembering our God and Father who gave his only begotten Son, and that Son who gave his life willingly in obedience to his Father on that cross. Let's pray as we get ready to partake of the loaf. Our God, we are thankful that you had a plan for mankind to bring us back to you because of our sin. We're thankful that we have a Savior who was willing to come to earth and live in the flesh. And we know, Lord, that he suffered great pain and agony and humility as he gave himself on that cross. As we partake of this loaf, which represents that body that he did give, we pray that we take in a pleasing manner, remembering his love for us, and the love that you had for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's pray for the blood that he shed. Lord, we're brought back to the cross and we're reminded of the suffering and pain that Jesus endured, but of the great love that you had for man in giving your son. We're thankful for his blood that was shed because that blood has the power to cleanse the sins of all mankind for all who will believe and obey and a continual cleansing of those who walk in the light as he is in the light. May we partake of this in a pleasing manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
We're now separate from the Lord's Supper. We take this opportunity to give as we've been prospered. The Word teaches us that we should lay by in store. We should give cheerfully. And we ask for the guidance of the elders in that distribution. Let's have a prayer, please. Lord, we recognize that all things are yours, uh, that you've blessed us in abundance, and that we're to be stewards of those things that we are blessed with. We pray, Lord, that we've made the decision in our hearts to give to you freely, and we do that cheerfully, and that it will be used for the good works of the church here at Duncan. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like for you to turn to 544 if you're using the book, 544. 544. John will be coming forward and bringing us our lesson here after we sing this song, 544. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I should. Today is going to be come to the feast, and that uh, will be on our screen because it's not in our book, which is a great surprise. John had two or three more songs I'd love to lead, but if I did, Paul would come up after this service and say, Carter, you're through. So uh, I better guess I better not do that. So anyway, John now is going to bring us our lesson, Come to the Feast, our song of invitation. John. If you're wondering where, where our minister is, this, song, this picture popped up somewhere on social media. I figured he's on a holy missionary trek, probably to Jerusalem. You can see he's got his staff and his cover, you know, his poncho. If, if, if that's not it, am I on? I'm not on. Well, I was on. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, I turned it off. Ah, there we go. Now, I fear he's on a holy mission. See his track, his his 
his poncho and his staff. But if that's not it, then he may be escaping from a Chinese prison. There's the jungle he's coming out on, a log bridge. So Wednesday night, I expect him to be here. So I want you all to ask him what it was like in a Chinese prison. And if you're not here Wednesday night, what's your excuse for not being here Wednesday night? We're going to talk about excuses today. Excuses. Let's turn to it. Now this wasn't in the printout on, in the, uh, for some reason didn't come through on the printout in the bulletin. So turn to Luke 14. The basis for our sermon is Luke 14. We'll read verses 16 to 24. But he said to them, a certain man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to try them out. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I, I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and among the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Now this parable is important to Christians and non-Christians alike. Now the question we have to ask about parables, why is it important? Not just what it means, but why is it important at all? Because Jesus talks about two things in this parable. He talks about time and He talks about eternity. In 1 Timothy 4 and 8, we read, Godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The present life is time. That's what we have. That's what we use, so spend thriftily all the time. Time, that's our present life. The life to come is eternity. And, Tim, and Paul tells Timothy, godliness is profitable for both time, our present life, and for eternity, which is the life to come. Our life to come is as real as our present life is right now. Eternity is as much a reality as time is. The promise that we're given is that godliness holds promise, both not only for our time spent here on earth, but just as it does for eternity. Oh, we know godliness holds promise for eternity. We know with godliness, you know, we have a chance for eternal life with God. That's, that's, but we ignore the fact that godliness is a promise for us in this life too. Godliness is, a, is promised us for time spent here on earth. In 2 Peter 3 and 9 we read, The Lord is not slow about His promise. So godliness in this life is rewarded by God. Very important promise is that godliness in this life will be rewarded by God. And when Jesus says, discusses time and eternity, it profits us to listen. So why is this parable important to us? Why is? Because Jesus talks about time and eternity. And godliness holds promise for time and eternity. And when Jesus talks about it, that's what makes it important. 
So he runs up against excuses. Now, the excuses that are given are false. For example, we have an excuse, I'm not a hired employee, so I don't have to come. And we've heard that about a lot of things. You're not my boss, I don't have to do that. I don't have to come. All of us have heard this before, and we all understand it. And God is, does not hire the people that He asks to come. However, the excuses that these people offer could apply to us. And that's why this lesson from Jesus is important. Because the excuses could be our excuses at certain times. So what are our popular excuses that we run into? First excuse. I'm too young. I can't obey the gospel. I'm too young. I don't need to. I, I'm too young. Well, some people are too young to obey the gospel. We know that. But let's remember what we're taught in the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes 12 and 1. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth. Now, is it important for those that are young to know about God? Well, God tells us, remember me when you're young. So that's important. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. So we're instructed as adults to train up a child. So somewhere along the line, you're not too young to know about God and to be trained about God. In Ephesians 6 and 4, And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We adults have been given a command to teach the young, to instruct them in God's ways. And yes, even in the fact that God is real. Among all the instruction being given to him, to them today that he isn't. Let me tell you, the children who grow up in the school system today are being taught in lots of different ways that God does not exist. It's becoming more and more of a problem. It is our responsibility to teach the children that God is, that He's real, that He's with us, that He has a discipline for us, He has a plan for us, but that He is, because they're told time and time again that God isn't real. They're out there, they're being told that. We talked about false teachers in class today. And if you weren't there, read the book of Jude. It will refer you back some to 2 Peter. False teachers are all over the place. And they're instructing our children on a day-to-day -day basis. If those children aren't trained about God any other way than what they get in the school, they will come out as adults not believing in God. Do you realize that three quarters of all church members come from Bible classes? The reason for Bible classes is to help us fulfill the command to teach. The worth of Bible classes is seen in the conversions of these young souls to Christ. Now, the New Testament doesn't talk about Sunday school. We're not told, oh, you have to have a Sunday school with the other patterns of worship. No, but we're told to teach. We have chosen Bible classes, or Sunday school sometimes, as a means of fulfilling that command to teach. We know how important it is, especially to the children, and three-quarters of all uh, members of the church come from Bible classes. So the reason for Bible classes is to help us fulfill the command to teach. And the worth of Bible classes is seen in the conversion of these young people to Christ. So even though we need to teach others on our own, we should not ignore the worth of Bible classes, especially for youngsters. 
So I'm too young. Doesn't quite hold water when you see that God's told us to teach the young, to raise them up to know about God. Okay, well, second excuse. I'm not going to come to church or obey God or be faithful because I'm just not good enough. I'm just not good enough. Okay, look at the person. You're not good enough. Well, at what point in your life do you expect you will be good enough? That's the point. I'm not good enough is an excuse, but it's just an excuse. When do you, when do you expect that you will be good enough? 2 Timothy 3.13 Evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So left on his own, man does not spontaneously change without any teaching or any other way from bad to good. He has to have proper guidance and instruction. I'm not good enough, but one day when I'm walking down the street, I'm suddenly going to come to the realization that I am good enough to come to church and be, you know, be converted to Christ. I'll be good enough when that happens. That's not going to happen. Men go left on their own. God says men go from bad to worse. Matthew 9, 13, Jesus says, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The church is not a hotel for saints. The church is a hospital for sinners. Nobody here is ever good enough. None of us is good enough. But if we thought we weren't good enough to be converted or to be saved, we're selling God awful short because He came for us. Romans 5 and 6, While we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God died, Christ died for the people who weren't, quote, good enough. If you feel that you're just not good enough for God, you have to realize that you're exactly the person God is looking for. If you don't realize that, I will assure you, somebody else is looking for you. 1 Peter 5 and 8, Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone you to devour. If you don't feel like you're good enough for God, I guarantee you, somebody else out there thinks you're good enough for Him, and He's looking for you. That's the devil. If your excuse for unfaithfulness is that you're not good enough, God says, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 and 2. I'm not good enough to come to church. I'm not good enough to be faithful to God. I'm not good enough to believe. Well, God says, now's the time. Now's the time. God's looking for you. You're exactly the person He's looking for. And now's the time for salvation. Okay. Some people say, I'm too good. And I'm certainly better than the many people in the church. They're just a bunch of hypocrites over there. Now, most people don't use that as an excuse anymore, outright. But a lot of people feel that way in their hearts. Some people feel if they're that good, they realize they think that they're good enough to direct their own way, to guide their own steps. I'm good enough to go my way. I'm good enough to make my own way. I'm good enough to make these decisions for myself. I don't need to come to church to do it. I don't need God to tell me I'm good enough. Jeremiah 10, 23. Now this is hundreds of years before Christ. Okay, Jeremiah says, A man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. Someone who really believes that he's better than the faithful or better than Christians in general has to be taught what? Humility before God. When it all comes down to it, the person says, well, I'm better than those people over there in that church. He needs to be taught what it is to be humble before God. In 
the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. Oh, what are you saying, Jesus? I'm good enough, Lord, Lord. If there's a salvation, I'm good enough, I'm there. But Jesus says, wait a minute. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, who will? It's the person who is obedient to what God says. Obedient. Well, okay. If a man does the will of the Father, the man must humble himself before the Father. If your own earthly father tells you to do something, in order for you to do it, you have to humble himself to his will. You have to be humble before your father and accept what he orders you in order to get it done. To do his will, you have to humble yourself to his will. In order to do what God says, to fulfill his will, because Jesus says, those who enter will do my father's will, we have to humble ourselves before the will of the father. Someone who says he won't even eat supper with that fella. Have you heard that before? Well, I won't even sit down at the same dinner table with him. Well, obviously, that fella is not humble enough to love the man. Let's face it. If we carry a grudge to the fact that we're better than him and we don't want to be with him, we're not even going to eat with him, much less have fellowship with him, what are we doing? We're saying... I'm not humble enough to love him. We've been commanded to love him. How can we say that and purport to know God, purport to do the will of God, purport to love people as ourselves? In the first century, when Jesus established the church, the Jews had to learn to accept the Gentiles. And we read about that in the New Testament. We know that Culturally, that was a problem. Now, we don't accept the real meaning of it sometimes. That seems so far and so distant, so much in the past. The Jews not accepting the Gentiles. But it's a big thing. Well, do we have any big things that we compare it to? Now, anybody who is as old as I am was raised in the 50s. And I was raised in the South. And I was raised in a good Christian home. There was no prejudice uh, exercised in that home. But let me tell you, I was surrounded by it in the South. The civil rights legislation was just beginning to come down the pike. It was overdue, but it was coming down. And it was coming down like a roaring train. And the people in the South weren't ready to accept it so quickly. <clears throat> that was a, it was a big thing. You talk about a big thing. I remember the colored only water fountains. I remember the colored only bathrooms. I remember the white only schools. I remember the back of the buses. I, mean, I was a kid, but I saw that. I didn't understand it. I didn't know why, but it was there. And the feelings were expressed around me and the population. Civil rights was a big thing in the South in the 50s. A big thing. It was a big thing. The Jews didn't accept the Gentiles. It was a big thing. Can we understand that a little bit better? In the South, we thought we were better. One race was better than the other. That's not accepting. That's not loving. It was a big thing. Now, y'all, most of y'all know that we lost our son on 1 July, a heat stroke. But he had his personal mission to help the people who didn't have anything. He had a mission of going out among the homeless people and teaching them about God and counseling them how to get along how to find a place to live, 
what to do with themselves. He lived among them sometimes. He helped them. He gave them places to live. That was his personal mission. Now what if he had always regarded the homeless as below him? What if he had always said, those people aren't worth my time. I'm better than them. Why should I spend my time doing it? Those people would never have been helped. Scott went there and helped him. He did that a lot. An individual, person to person, he helped. That was somebody who actually thought he wasn't better than they were. Is that a big thing? On an individual level? You betcha. A big thing. So we need to understand the Jews weren't accepting the Gentiles. It was a big thing. One group thinking they were better than another group is not serving God. If someone won't accept Christ and His church because he feels they are too good for the church, there are a lot of examples we can use to show them the utter falseness of that, exa- uh, that excuse. We've just talked about a couple. Okay, what's the next excuse? My faith won't hold out. Well, I can come and obey the gospel. I can come and be faithful, but I'm not going to last. I don't know what the use is. There's no sense in my even doing it because my faith is not big enough or good enough to last. It won't hold out. You know, if we are instructed to forgive our brother seven times, 70 times, okay, why do we try to put a limit on God's forgiving us? Do we think God is only going to forgive us one time and when our faith doesn't hold out, it's over? So what's the use? After we're baptized, the blood of Jesus continues in an active way to wash away our sins if we repent from the heart. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of Jesus' blood. John says he continues to wash us clean. We need to repent and he can forgive. The man who uses personal insecurities as an excuse for not being baptized or for not being faithful to God is a man who hasn't accepted the power or the truth of the power of Jesus' blood. The truth is in the word of God. There is no greater need to know what the word says than to understand the power inherent in the sacrifices of Jesus the Christ. And that's one reason I love Carter's selections of songs. Carter preaches a sermon by his song leading. I feel like the speaker can just go home after Carter's song service. If we know the words, if we sing from the heart, the lesson is there. So the truth is there. The Word says to understand the power that's inherent in the Word of God, in the blood of our Christ. So your faith won't hold out. Don't sell God short. He will forgive you. Don't sell Him short. But now we get to the biggies. These are the ones we hear more often, more commonly, and we have to know how to deal with them. The next one is, my associates will ridicule me. Excuse me, (laughs) are you a teenager afraid of peer pressure? My associates will ridicule me. We've got to remember what's at stake here. What does Jesus say we're talking about? We're talking about time and eternity. You are not the first person in history to face ridicule for doing what's right. Now, Joshua 24, 15, you need to write on a 3 by 5 card and put it on your refrigerator door. Quote, And if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, are the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, 
We will serve the Lord. Now you're going to serve somebody. An atheist serves somebody. Everybody ends up in a servitude to someone or something. So choose. Are you going to choose to serve the Lord? As Joshua says, for me and my house, we're going to choose to serve the Lord. We need to focus on that, put that in our refrigerator. We can read it from time to time. If a man doesn't think he has the courage to do this, then have him consider the other side of the coin. If you don't think you're brave enough to stand up against associates who ridicule you because you want to do what's right and serve God, all right, think about them. Think about your opposition. Think about the associates who are doing the ridiculing. Let's turn together. Psalms 107, Psalms 107, verse 10. Let's think about who is doing the ridiculing. There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Wow. Who's your opponents? Who are those that are opposing you and ridiculing you? They live in darkness. They're in misery. They're in chains. That means they're serving the devil. They had rebelled against the words of God, and that's why they were there. Wow. We should really be ashamed if we use this excuse. Well, one that's a little bit more serious is the next one. My family will object. Okay? If someone says that, what are you going to say? Is your mother or is your father or is your brother going to answer for you a judgment? When you stand beside God in judgment, will a member of your family going to stand there and answer for what you do? John Smith, who is a known pioneer preacher, once said, No, I must act for myself. That's a short statement, but it has a lot of meaning. No, I must act for myself. Matthew 10, 35 Jesus says, I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his household. If a member of your family objects to you or being faithful to God, Jesus has already said, he's come to set set apart those family members. It takes a lot of courage to be, a faith, to be faithful to God. It takes a lot of courage to be a Christian. But you've got to remember, Jesus is talking about time and eternity. Godliness will reward us in this life, and a godly life will be rewarded in eternity. Last excuse. Well, okay, I've got some courage. I've got some humility. I know God will will forgive me. I'm old enough now to understand. But look... There's just too many ways. <laughs> Look, there's just too many ways. Which way is right? Which is right? <sighs> Look at the person. What does Jesus say? Listen, you're saying too many ways. Look at the Bible. Jesus says, follow me. Two words, follow me. 
which is the right way to go. Jesus says, follow me. Remember the Christians in Thessalonica. In Acts 17, 11, it says, who were commended because they examined the scriptures daily to see what God had said was right. They wanted to know what God, what God said was right. And they examined the, the scriptures daily and they were commended for doing that. That is our example today. Which way is right? Follow me. We've got to examine the scriptures to know what way is right. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, Oh boy, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's, all this, there's this other way, and there's this other way, and there's this other way, and all the way over here to the other wall. And Jesus says, I'm the way. He didn't say, I'm one of the ways. So he say, I can choose any of those and I'll be all right, right? Jesus says, look, this, I'm the way. I am the truth. Well, how many truths are there? The truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one gets there except through Jesus Christ. So when Jesus says, follow me, that is the way, we should set our course that way. How do we find out what that way is? Just like the Christians at Thessalonica. We study the scriptures daily. The answers are there. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. There is but one way and there is only one truth. Everything else is man-made and will not hold up the judgment. What's man-made? Everything that God didn't ordain or authorize. Did God put guitars in the church? No. Man put guitars in the church. Is that a proper way to worship God? What does the scripture say? It says, worship Him with the words of your heart and sing and make melody to God. Did they have instruments in the first century? Absolutely. Did the Jews use instruments in their worship? Absolutely. Did David talk about using instruments in worship? Yes. They had them, but they weren't in the first century church. The New Testament says, sing and make melody in your heart. It doesn't say, play a guitar. Will God say one day, okay, it's all right. I thought guitars was a good addition. Will God say that? Well, you have to realize. Who authorized it in the first place? Did God authorize it? No, man authorized it. Will God accept what man authorized? I don't know. That's God's authority. I mean, God's privilege to say so. But I'm not going to do... I don't know about that. Am I willing to bet my eternity on that? It worries me. It worries me. We think man authorizes this for our own good, our own benefit. It'll be okay. But the Bible doesn't say put guitars in the church. Does God does it say okay to be, be saved without baptism? We were at a secular service one time. The man stood up at the end and said, Hey, who wants to be saved? Raise your hand. She raised her hand. I said, Okay, you're saved. Raise your hand. Okay, you're saved. Those people left that meeting. They felt like they'd been saved. Is that God's way? Did God authorize that way of salvation? Well, we know it didn't. God's, God's system for salvation is right there in the Word. That's His authority. He set that down. If man chose to change it, it's man-made. Man-made. Is homosexuality okay today? Well, it wasn't okay in Old Testament times. They were taken out from the, from the people and stoned to death. Was it okay in the first century? No. Paul teaches us in depth about homosexuality. And the, you know, the church at Corinth had people who were homosexuals at one time. And he says, you were that way, but you've been 
changed. You've been baptized. You've been made Christians. You've been cleansed by the blood of Christ. You no longer behave that way. Then all of a sudden, 2,000 years go by, and man says, it's okay. I'm saying it's okay. It's all right. You were born that way. You don't have to worry about behaving anything. Behavior is a choice. That's a whole different lesson. Behavior is a choice. We choose to behave that way. And it may be hard not to behave a certain way. We may have a compunction to behave in a way which isn't right. But God doesn't say it's okay because you have that compunction or that urge. He says that's not right. You don't do that. You don't do that. So which way is right? Is it man's way? You can be a homosexuality and a faithful member of the church. You can practice homosexuality all you want to. Because today we've determined it's right. Is that man-made? Yes. Is it God-made? No. Which is going to save you? Which, is going to, which way are you going to believe in when it comes time to stand before God in judgment? Is it okay to steal? No. We've never said it was okay to steal. But some people have the compunction to steal. I just can't resist it. I mean, that, that looks so good. I'm just going to put it in my pocket. That's stealing. That's taking something that's not yours. God say it's okay? No. He never says it's okay. We know it's not okay, but you behave in a way which makes you a thief. Is that okay? No. Never has been. We can understand that. Why can't we understand other things that man tries to set up for us? Let's look at 1 John. Turn over to 1 John 4. 1 John 4 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And that this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and now it is already in the world. The man who doesn't believe that Jesus is the only way is the man who is not confessing Jesus is from God and he's the Antichrist. Jesus himself has declared that this excuse, there are just too many ways for me to know which to go, is false. Romans 1.20 For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. We can see the power of God, the nature of God, through what has been made. It's clear. We've talked about this before. All the philosophies and of man that exclude God from creation or from life are false and don't hold water because creation itself and its many attributes, biochemical, etc., declare the handiwork of God. The people who deny that are without excuse. Man has no valid excuse for not obeying God. The reason he doesn't obey God is because his heart is not set on it. In Colossians 3, first two verses, we read, Keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. Every morning when you wake up, try to set your head 
on things above. Set your heart on glorifying God. That's the answer to false excuses. That's the answer we need to give to God. My heart is set on you because I'm listening to you. I'm obeying you. I believe in you. There is no answer but you. And you speak of time and eternity. And if you seek that godliness, God says He will reward you here in this time as well as in eternity. If you haven't been saved, if you haven't confessed the name of Jesus and been buried with Him in baptism, repent of your sins. Come believing. The waters are ready. You can be baptized and you can rise again. A new Christian, a new person, ready to accept the godliness that's yours for Him to give. If you've been unfaithful, you're a Christian, you've strayed from the right way, come seek the prayers of this host. The elders will be here. They'll help you. They'll talk to you. They'll pray with you. Things will be set right. God continues to forgive. Don't ever sell Him short. If He tells us to forgive each other that many times, God will forgive us. If you find the need to come, let's do so as we stand and sing. Come for the door is open wide. A place of honor is reserved for you at the master's side. Here the invitation come so ever will praise God for full salvation. John, you are rightly divided in preaching the Word of God today, and there are no excuses. As y'all know, a lot of times uh, at the church at Velma, they call John to come over and to preach for them, and I appreciate the fact that he, John generally kind of drags me along with him, and I'll tell you right now, he has had some wonderful lessons over there as we can see the way he preached here today. Our dismissal prayer today will be led by Terry Painter. After Terry does that, we're going to sing the first and last stanzas of 523. So, Terry, if you'll lead us in our dismissal prayer, please. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we... Thank you for the good sermon that John brought to us, as he always yeah. does. Father, we've all heard the excuses that he's brought out. 
both in our lives and throughout the land. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would be with us, that we would take that lesson to our hearts, and that we would live as you would have us to, Father. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you'd be with everyone. Everyone has problems. Everyone has their excuses. But, Father, help them to remember what excuse they're going to give when they come face to face with you. Because we all will face that, Father. And there'll be many who say that they are okay in life with you, that they're living for you, but when they come face to face, they may be told to depart from you, that you know them not. What a terrible thing that would be, Father. We pray that you would be with each one of us here, that we would continuously, each day, examine our lives and make sure that we're doing the best that we can to live for you and at the same time realize that none of us are perfect. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would be with those of the number who are ill, that are mentioned in the bulletin, those that we may not know of, Father, that they may return to good health and be thy will. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, as we leave here, that we'll leave here and live for thee as you'd have us to. Forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I know the Lord will find a way for me. I know the Lord will find a way for me. If I walk in heaven's light, shall the wrong and do the right. I know the Lord will find a way for me. Won't it be grand and say, hey, well done. Won't it be grand to say, well done. If I walk in heaven's light, shut the wrong.